to be honest with you, that first year at the bottom of the triangle, you truly are at the bottom. You learn a lot about yourself and the people around you, but often you're just trying to survive. As each year builds with more experience, so becomes more autonomy. And the things that seemed as basic as where the bathroom is now evolves to where is the operating room and who's in the operating room and what cases are happening in the operating room. From the basement to the boardroom, from ideas to innovation, you're listening to the Beyond Clean podcast, the central nexus for the people, processes, and products that are pushing the sterile processing industry forward. Each week, you'll encounter diverse perspectives from subject matter experts across the country and around the globe. Frontline technicians, CEOs, engineers, and entrepreneurs with a common goal to help you fight dirty. Every instrument, every time. Whether you are tuning in for education or inspiration, we're glad you're here. Now, turn on those washers and turn up the volume. It's time to go beyond clean. On this episode of Beyond Clean, we are going to continue our season speaking with surgeons. And today, it's going to be a conversation from the perspective of a resident with Dr. Allison Hunter, fellowship trained hand surgeon at Baldwin Bone and Joint. And Hank, we are going to be talking again about what it's like to be a resident, what that early perceptions are of sterile processing and we have a mutual friend or acquaintance with Dr. Hunter, which we'll talk about as well. Yeah, Justin, we talked a lot about the podcast on what it's like to be a new technician and you know, onboarding and orientation from the sterile processing side of things. But we haven't yet talked about what's that like from that resident surgeon perspective, even though we did talk a couple of weeks ago about you know what it's like to teach these residents. Now is going to be an opportunity to dig in behind the scenes on, yeah, but when you're brand new into the OR and your name's doctor, what does that feel like? I know that's going to be a fantastic story to link that experience with what's going on all around you with the surgical instruments in his hidden department out there called sterile processing. How do they learn about them? All right, don't go anywhere. Dr. Allison Hunter, up next. I'm Justin Poulin. And I'm Hank Balch. From 17 Studios, you're listening to Beyond Clean, the global voice of sterile processing. We are speaking with Dr. Allison Hunter, fellowship trained hand surgeon at Baldwin Bone and Joint. And I'm just going to go ahead and let the cat out of the bag. Dr. Hunter, you were introduced to us by my co-host on the First Case podcast, Melanie Perry, who also has hosted a number of Beyond Clean conferences and is involved there, but mainly our voice and face of the First Case podcast. So you work together. I might try to plug you for a little bit of background or maybe a funny story about Melanie <laughs> before we finish and wrap up, but I just wanted to welcome you to the show and, and thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me. I love Melanie. She was very kind to me as a trainee, which is where I met her in Birmingham, Alabama. I was an orthopedic surgery resident there for five years in 2015 to 2020 and worked with Melanie through the hospital uh, in Birmingham Highlands through the University of Alabama at Birmingham. She kept the wheels on the bus, so to speak. I don't, I can't imagine what they're doing without her now. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I feel very lucky to have known her. And it's a very unique time, I think, in life, particularly as a resident, as you climb through years one through five, you are gaining independence and autonomy and confidence, all while still remaining to be the lowest man on the totem pole. So, you remember the people that treat you well, and Melanie is one of those humans, and so I'll always appreciate her. Why don't you tell us about your background? You mentioned you met Melanie in Birmingham, and you were, you were new. Talk about your experience and maybe even add some color into your experience as a resident, even beyond how much Melanie kind of 
helped along and was a resource at that time? Sure. So I am from Eastern Kentucky originally, Ashland, Kentucky, which is right around the tri-state area between Ohio, West Virginia, and Kentucky. I did my undergraduate at the University of Louisville in Louisville, Kentucky. That's Louisville, not Louisville. Can't, you said it right. That's good. I'm proud of Louisville, you know, I'm going to Louisville, and fell in love with that place and the city. And I stayed there for medical school. So I did eight years total at the University of Louisville. Was introduced to orthopedic surgery in that location and through the department and fell in love with it and the people through that medium. As a fourth-year medical student, I did an away rotation at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, among other places. And that month there was everything. It, it, you just I found my place and found my people and ultimately went on to become an orthopedic surgery resident in that location in Birmingham. So I moved from Louisville to Birmingham in 2015, started my residency in 2015, and did the five-year program graduating in 2020. I met Melanie through one of the private-ish hospitals called Highlands, which is where we do a lot of our elected, traditionally elective outpatient, whether it's total joints, hand up or extremity, or foot and ankle. Those are typically the cases that we turned out in that location. From five years in orthopedics at the University of Alabama, Birmingham, I then did a one-year fellowship at the Philadelphia Hand to Shoulder Center in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. That is through Thomas Jefferson University. That's a one-year training program. And from that one year, 2020 to 2021, I then took a job with a group in Daphne, Alabama called Baldwin Bone and Joint. It's a private practice group, and I'm the first hand and upper extremity surgeon uh, in that group and the first full-time hand and upper extremity surgeon in Baldwin County, which is the fastest growing county in Alabama. So it's been crazy. It's been a crazy now year and a half, first year and a half in practice, um, learning a lot. And then now it's been great to see medicine and surgery and life on the trainee side and now the surgeon uh, boss lady side to some extent. <laughs> <laughs> you were right in our backyard. Hank and I are in Pennsylvania now, but Hank right. knows a little something about Louisville. Actually, that's where I started my sterile processing career there at the Baptist Health System. Ended up managing the Jewish hospital there in town. Oh, and then wow. probably around the same time, you were going to school, it sounds like, took over managing the University of Volvo Hospital in their sterile processing department. So, yeah, we might have crossed each other in the hallways, who knows, back then. So, that's kind of cool to hear. It's funny that you bring up that Melanie was very kind to you in your time during residencies because that's kind of a theme that I want to – Start digging into right now in the sterile processing perspective. When we hear the residents are coming or the residents are going to be here next month, you know, there's a certain connotation that that means to us on the surgical instrument side of things. But I'd like you to kind of take us behind the scenes in the perspective of the resident, right? So, like, what do those early days of that surgical residency look like and feel like from your perspective? I'll say up front that each year is different with its own challenges and success stories. So if you think of residency as a triangle, at the bottom of the triangle is your PGY one year, where essentially you have the least amount of independent autonomy, but in the same breath, you are learning arguably the most. You're learning Things from where the bathroom is located to what Adson's forceps are to learning how to be a responsible physician and stay safe. And to be honest with you, that first year at the bottom of the triangle, you truly are at the bottom. You learn a lot about yourself and the people around you, but often you're just trying to survive. As each year builds with more experience, so becomes more autonomy and the things that seemed as basic as where the bathroom is now evolves to where is the operating room and who's in the operating room and what cases are happening in the operating room. And you find ways to stay alive based on what is 
the most pertinent thing to you. I would say in the beginning, that's anatomy. So understanding what you're doing, why, and the safest approach to whatever joint or fracture or orthopedic problem. With the anatomy, so begins the understanding of the pathology. And when you can understand the pathology, you begin to understand why you're there. And then finally, what you hope to accomplish. And then it's the surgery, right? After, after you've taken in all of, all of the other details. So the perception that the residents don't know anything in the beginning, that's probably <laughs> accurate. <laughs> However, as you get to the, the end of your training to your PGY five year, theoretically the top of the triangle, though it is still a low triangle, you are much more in command of the higher level thinking when it comes to not just why are the cases happening, but what cases and what order. I think you're thinking about running multiple rooms. And when you have multiple rooms, you have to think about case type and case pace and the physical and mental energy that goes into that and instrumentation that's available or not available because certain things such as let's say a microsurgical tray, those are very specific instrumentation requirements. And so you can't have two rooms or the need for successive cases to call on those instruments. And you're not thinking about that as a PGY-1. Again, you're wondering what the best splint is, but as a PGY-5, you really need to think about what instrumentation do you need? What implants do you need? So I hope in your experience with trainees, you have seen that beautiful evolution of self happen from complete ignorance and idealism to practicality, realism, and capability. I mean, I'll tell you, there's still surgeons out there that I think need to learn about. <laughs> Can you schedule successive cases based on that limited inventory structure that you laid out. So if we got residents are learning that, I have hope for the future. So that's very helpful. And, you know, just given that human side, that's one of the reasons that I asked that question is to, to remind folks in the sterile processing side, on the operating room side, that it's not, to your point, not all residents are created equal. Even in just that pyramid that you described, they're at different places in that learning experience. And obviously, they're all individuals, you know, so to put them all in one bucket and treat them all the same and expect all the same responses, it's just not fair to, you know, real life. And I think that came across very strongly in your answer. So I appreciate the insight there. And I want to keep on digging. I'm coming back to that residency experience here and ask you another one that's just real practical because you kind of said, hey, like in the beginning, we're still trying to figure out like, where's the bathroom in this place? As you get in there, obviously the relationship side of that begins the build. So I'd like you to kind of speak to that for a second here. Talk to us about how you got introduced or how you get to know the other players in that perioperative space. Obviously, you know your other residents. You're going to be familiar, probably more familiar with the other surgeons, but you know the OR nurses like Melanie and the surgical techs. And I kind of got a second question. Did you ever get introduced to sterile processing in your residency experience? So kind of just talk about that here for a moment. Okay. I would say that the the fortunate thing about where I went to residency is that we were introduced to the operating room very early as an intern, and some places are not that way. But one of the things that was very clear, whether you as a trainee acknowledge that or not, is that there is a there is within not just medicine but within the operating room there's a I, I hesitate to say hierarchy, but there is a team. And each team member has a role. That team name and label and what that role is, is not spelled out. It is not explicit. It would be lovely if everyone had a hat that said anesthesia or resident PGY1 or attending physician or scrub or scrub student. But that's not how it works. That becomes evident with the more experience that you have, whether that is through the easy way or the hardware. The easy way is that you feel it out. You introduce yourself. You're transparent. This is who I am. How can I help? You try to be kind and friendly and proactive and understand your role as much as their role within the operating room. And I think when you have that layer of self-awareness, you are accepted a bit easier 
than some that may say, I'm Dr. So-and-so and and I'm scrubbing in and where are my gloves? (laughs) So it's much easier to, I think, feel your way through it. But no one tells you that. No one tells you that it is a little bit of a dance. It's a tango and you have to feel the pulse and the pressure. You have to understand when to be available and helpful and when to fall back. And a lot of that is just observation. You watch how people interact. You can see successful interactions and unsuccessful interactions. But I'll tell you, it is, it, it's not as easy as what you think. And if you unintentionally step on toes, say, trying to be helpful, maybe you're a little too helpful. And that rubs people the wrong way. Perhaps you could be perceived as overly assertive or short-sighted, not being aware of space or even understanding what sterile field is. So yeah, that is that can be a very difficult lesson to learn. I think that's probably why it's a piece of the five-year experience. And some people like Melanie are are much kinder along the way. If there is a need for a correction, not necessarily a reprimand, but a correction, those are the people that you can lean on to give you good feedback in a way that isn't demeaning or distracting. But yeah, you want to be a part of the team. You want to be helpful. Just nobody tells you exactly who's on the team until the, you're midway through the game. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and well, I'll tell you, you talked about the roles, not quite a hierarchy, but that really depends on the culture. Because in some cases, the roles are almost presented like hierarchy. And in other cases, you know, it's team. And I think a lot of that has changed over the years, specifically as I think organizations are focused on culture and really having that positive environment that way so that people can come up and tell you like, hey, this is what this is what I saw, right? And that can be helpful for everybody's growth. I think that's that's so critical just in the evolution. And I would say outside of healthcare, that's just team building that I think is being more and more focused on, you know, in general in society and businesses, but not in all cases. And it's interesting that you you kind of described that because I'm thinking back to an episode we had talking about signage and how signage can really help the new employees navigate sort of sterile processing. What area am I in? What does this station do? What are the steps that should be executed here? And how valuable that was. And I'm thinking about how you said there's really no identifiers. You don't know who is in what role based on the color scrubs they're wearing. Well, maybe vendors, but outside of vendors, like what color scrubs people are wearing. And I almost think that could be really helpful, but it could also contribute to that you know, almost click nature and stratification. And you're trying to not, you're trying to prevent that. So there's a trade-off for just about everything. I kind of wanted to ask you next about the instruments themselves, because you said by the time you're, you know, you're in that fifth year, it's totally different. But somewhere along the line, you have to start using instruments. You need to start learning maybe some of the names. And we've already talked this season about the struggles with vernacular in general around instrument names. It can have lots of, you know, names that are created in the facility versus the proper name of the instrument. And that can create communication breakdowns. But I'm even thinking about how did you practice on the instruments? You know, I know you did, you know, likely some practicing not on patients, but was that a completely different experience when you began to use the instruments on the patients? And are you nervous going into that first case or how do they bring you along? That's a good question. And I remember as a medical student in Louisville feeling feeling overwhelmed by all of those things. And there was a very kind scrub who would sit back with me on the back table if there was idle time and go over with me by name. I would say, what's that? And she'd say this, what's that? And then she'd quiz me. I'm not, I don't think that that's commonplace, so to speak. I think it's probably like anything else. When you show interest and you want to learn those things, then other, then people will invest in you similarly. I think that the other layer of it as a resident comes in with a lot of the observation of what your attending is doing or what your boss or what your senior resident is doing. So you're watching those things. If they were really intricate procedures and things I really wanted to know the next step, I would write it down. I would write down not just the instrument, but what we were using the instrument for and the sequence of the instrumentation. So for example, I had a great arthroplasty attending who he exposed, did an anterior approach to the hip every time. 
the same way, the same instrumentations in the same sequence every single time. And while to some that may be, I don't know, a bit overly detailed to me, it was perfect because you knew what to anticipate. You knew what was coming next. And it was such a beautiful symphony to see his scrub that had worked with him so many times anticipate him because before he ever said the word, which of course you can't audibly hear, it's that you have the hoods on and everybody's mumbling. And somehow she knew that was the next step or he knew that was the next step. And so I think it's a combination of observation, following patterns, creating your own notes, however you learn. And then as you perform repetition, whether that's through observation or ultimately being involved in the case, that sol- that solidifies it now. So those things that so- felt so overwhelming in the beginning are almost second nature with that because now he doesn't think about it. He just knows the next step. And towards the end, with that anterior brush to the hip, so did I. Now, as a hand and upper extremity surgeon, I would have to go back to those notes and relive that experience. But I find that those similarities in hand and upper extremity surgery as well, it just happened at a later time. You did ask at some point what my introduction to sterile processing was. I was going back there, so I'm glad you did. I would say now seeing things from different sides as a first as a resident then as a first as a junior resident, then as a senior resident, as a fellow, and now as an attending, man, that experience has taken on so many different roles. I would say as a matter of being in an academic system, that was probably the most overwhelming and perhaps at times chaotic experience with sterile processing in the sense that the system is so large, the university is so large, the cases are so varied that if there was something wrong, say on the serial processing side, it was it was hard to anticipate where an error came up. But that was, I think that was my experience as a resident. Well, we can't do X because this instrumentation is not available. This It wasn't sterile or they opened it and there was a hole in the sterile pro- packaging. And for that reason, this case is delayed. And now we're moving in another case, which throws everything else off. And so I kind of remember sterile processing in the beginning as being an educational, um, I don't want to say roadblock, but it's almost like Mario Kart where somebody throws a green eggshell at you and you have to dodge left and right and be flexible with what the system is because it's such a big system. It's it's the academic system and no one knows in the line where things can go wrong. It's just the world that's against you. (laughs) But as life has gone on and perhaps because there's more on my shoulders as an individual and not so much a cog in the wheel of academic training, I see and feel and interact with sterile processing to some extent every single surgical day. What what trays I need and what order, anticipating what instruments will and won't be available. Even today, I had three case, we have one microsurgical case and I had three cases where I needed that set. And we did a couple of things. We spaced out the cases or I would use the case up. I would use the microsurgical set up front and then immediately say, pass it off for the turnover process. So that, that, that has been an evolution, but I feel much more in control of what happens with the day to day, including the instrumentation that isn't, is not available perhaps because I'm more in the driver's seat, but perhaps because I'm in a medical system that is, far simpler, smaller, with fewer surgeons, less turnover, and there's, I think, fewer layers of accountability, meaning if something goes wrong, you know where the buck stops. Well, you went right where I was going with the next question because you went back to sterile processing, which I was going to tie into the next question, and you said when something goes wrong. And so as a resident, you know, what was it like when something went wrong with the instrumentation? What what was sort of the vibe in the operating room in that moment, right? Because now it's unexpected. You talk about having to be flexible, but that was more about case scheduling and delays than something, you know, in the middle of surgery going wrong and then having to react to that and knowing that the patient might be under anesthesia longer and that the case is going to take longer and all the implications of that. What was that environment like? And did you, as a resident, make an immediate 
connection to sterile processing in that moment. It, it sounds like you had, you know, kind of this experience of sterile processing, but it was very removed where you're much closer to it now. But I kind of, you know, want to want to probe that a little bit further, like when something went wrong with an instrument, what was it like in the operating room and how do people feel about sterile processing in that moment, especially you as a resident? Sure. So just to give context, I would say the times where that became increasingly um, evident or highlighted to me was at our main academic hospital at the University of Alabama, Birmingham at UAB. Our trauma volume was very high. And for that reason, we had multiple rooms in many cases in a day. And many of those cases were similar. So let's say a long bone fracture, for example, such as a femur fracture. Those require similar instrumentation sets. An instrument that comes to mind is a cannulated reamer. Well, a cannulated reamer, which is a sharp tool utilized to clean out the center of the canal of the bone, fits over a wire, is important. That's an important step to the surgery. You have to have it. And unfortunately, because it is cannulated within the barrel, there can be debris that goes unrecognized. And so we have a tray, it's opened, the set's now on the field, on the back table, which is theoretically sterile. And within that cannulated reamer, there's bone or there's soft tissue. And it's not been used in the patient, which has to presume that it is from a prior case. Then everything stops because there's the question of, well, is that sterile or is it not? This is a high stakes surgery. And if there's a bone infection that will delay healing and create complications, so that gets passed off, the sterile table gets broken down, and it is just very tense. Very, you can hear a pin drop. I think the first part is, is m management of the scenario, right? Anything that's not clean has to be done away with. We have to get a sterile field, field established. Pr anything that could be not sterile is passed off. Then we have to think about what alternative instrumentation options do we have? Is that close? Is that in the next room? Are you walking three corridors over to get it. And that's time, time that the patient is under anesthesia. The attending is not happy. Your boss isn't happy. Ain't nobody happy. <laughs> it, it's tense. And then you start asking the question of, well, why did this happen? Because now it's a longer surgery. And if it's longer surgery, it's a higher risk of infection. And I think it's natural as humans to want to point fingers to, I don't know if it's to lay blame, but I think more to figure out what the accountability system is in my mind so that it doesn't happen again and you can avoid these terribly stressful moments for everyone in the future. But yeah, it's it's not a lovely environment to be to be a part of. And it's such a bad introduction to the relationship <laughs> with sterile processing as a new surgeon, right? Is like you're just getting introduced to this team. And then you have these situations where it's like, uh, for whatever reason is and the cause is, this team had a part to play in, you know, delaying the care for this patient or, you know, canceling the case, like on and on and on, as you mentioned, like it's extremely tense and important. And yeah, you know, you just speaking that is giving me flashbacks to situations that happened to me as a technician or as a department manager in a level one trauma where I'm getting those calls on the weekend and it's just like, it's just happened and now how are you going to fix it? And unfortunately, many times there's not a good, simple answer, you know, to your point, like, where's the tray? Do we have one across the street in another hospital that we can borrow from? Like, can we begin that reprocessing in-house? So really important piece of that puzzle, but... I think it's important that it came out in this interview, especially because as we kind of move here to the close, one of my questions is how can we, as that sterile processing team and that residency team, collaborate better together to give each other experiences that are positive and understand each other in both the human factor, but also that kind of process factor that you mentioned? Because I can say on the sterile processing side, we're not in control of the process as much as we want to be. But we don't have all the equipment that we want. We don't have all the instruments that we want. We don't have all the time or the staffing that we want to actually ensure the quality that's being requested in the OR. And, you know, likewise, if you're getting cases delayed and canceled and everything else, 
you don't have the quality you want and you can't control that <laughs> process as well. So, you know, is there anything that you would kind of want to leave through your experiences in residency or, or, you know, since residency that you found successful, you know, building those relationships, those positive experiences? I think if at the forefront of everyone's mind, you can keep in mind that the reason why we do what we do is to help people and to do it safely. And if you can reframe the conversations in ways that accomplish that, taking care of patients safely and taking the personal onus of what what your own experience has been like or what your own frustrations or what you have or what you don't have or whose fault it is, I think that that helps you take a step back to understand that we are all human and that no matter how much happens or how much finger pointing may play out, at the end of the day, we ought to try to do our best to do the best that we can for patients. It's not about whether Sally left bone in the reamer, Sally didn't read in the femur, or if Joe re- reamed the femur. So I think it's less about finger pointing, realizing that p- there are other people on the side of this, not just sterile processing, not just the surgeons, but real patients. Then you can feel as though no matter how imperfect the system, every day you wake up trying to do the best that you can. And if a mistake happens, which it will, we're all human. You try to get to the source of what happened, what can we do differently, and and in an effort so that it doesn't happen again. Again, getting back to the original source of let's try to do the best that we can for the patients safely. I will say that having now been further away from that big world system in academics and closer to the everyday happenings of sterile processing, not just uh, figuratively, but literally and how present they are in and out of the hallways in our hospital. It is amazing how awesome they are. I think the only person that knows my own tray the hunter hand upper extremity tray or the microsurgical tray better than me is the sterile processing people. They know the jeweler's forceps. They know the exact non-locking microsurgical needle drivers that I use with regularity. And that if I don't have them, then we have to stop and do the peel pack situation. And that has been just so lovely to see them anticipate and pay such attention. And I know that the job they do is with excellence and I have a huge amount of respect for it. I love it. I love it. I think a big takeaway from what you said is the importance of connecting residents with sterile processing early, because it's about that closeness, that proximity, that interaction that gives you that understanding. I mean, size of organization is a big factor on that, even like you said, layers of accountability. But a lot of places will have residents you know, spend a half a day in sterile processing and see how that operation works. And, you know, it's not, you are learning and taking in so much. Like you also have the benefit of experience at this point where you can grow in these other areas instead of like really focusing on, you know, baseline fundamental knowledge and just getting your hands, you know, into all the different things that are surgery and that are priority. But we've heard from a number of organizations that, Having sterile processing, observe surgery and see what that's like. Having surgeons and and new nurses and surgical techs going to sterile processing and spending a little bit of time there has been really helpful with fostering those types of relationships as well. And I just think it's imperative in larger organizations to do that and maybe even to do it recurringly. So this was a great interview. I had, I had a lot of takeaways from the discussion, Dr. Hunter. I just I can't thank you enough. And I got to ask you, though, before we go what's a good story about Melody other than how much she helped you? You gotta, <laughs> you gotta tell me like one really good story. Cause she's a personality. Man. I don't know. I feel like sometimes residency is a little bit of like, you remember the good things and black out the bad things. <laughs> and she was inherent in the team where we did a lot of complex and revision joints. And those days started early and they ended very late. And I can just remember no matter how stressed or how overworked some of the people were or how long the days were, I mean, that she just had a smile on her face all the time. And again, she was kind in an environment that was high stakes, high stress, 
it facilitated just a lot of good energy in the room. I wish I could tell you something more uh, juicy or embarrassing. <laughs> but I think, again, I've blacked out the things that have taken up negative space and high- chosen to highlight the things that bring back a lot of joy and reassurance. And fortunately, unfortunately, that's Melanie, man. Yeah, She's well. Great. We love her smile too, Dr. Hunter. So uh, if that's what you remember, that's what we know. So that's great. Thanks so much for coming on the show at the end of a long day. I appreciate you guys. Thanks. That was Dr. Allison Hunter, fellowship trained hand surgeon at Baldwin Bone and Joint. And Hank, this was just such a critical perspective to bring to this season as we speak with you know surgeons for the entire eight episodes that perspective as the resident and as you said you teed it up really nicely well when we hear the residents are coming the residents are coming like that's it was just chiming in my mind was just oh here we go and <laughs> but you know there's two sides to that and you know i think also diving into the perspective of how sterile processing gets perceived I think we have to do more to pull the residents and sterile processing together, that mutual awareness. We've talked about it over and over on so many different episodes, but even Dr. Hunter's experience in a large facility versus a small facility or smaller really highlights, I think, the need, especially in larger organizations. Yeah, the chaos that she kind of mentioned in that academic setting is, uh, I mean, that's real life. And it's chaotic, you know, upstairs and downstairs, if you will, you know, between the two departments that we're scheduling and obviously the two teams. But I love the way that she wrapped it, you know, sharing that story about this is what happens now and the impact that that relationship with her sterile processing team and her facility now just building that ability to preempt what the surgeon needs and why they need it and why that's so critical to the case. That may not be possible in all the academic settings and trauma settings, everything else, you know, but the relationship part of that is possible. So the big takeaway for me, and I hope that encourages folks out there is, hey, when the residents are coming, get proactive, get out there, get some contact information, make those invites to come down to the department, invite yourself up to those rooms and introduce yourself because, yeah, they're meeting everyone else in the room right now. Might as well just add one more to sterile processing to that list and get them intro in the best way possible. Yeah, this episode kind of piggybacked with Dr. Sibulski really well, too, which I liked. And it kind of completed that other side of of the perspective from, from the residency. So really great stuff. And you can listen to the Beyond Clean podcast in a number of different ways. The best way is the smartphone app for iPhone or Android. Definitely go with Android. Don't be an iPhone addict like Hank. He's tied to the platform. <laughs> no, whatever you like, whatever you like, Android or iPhone, we've got it for both of your preference. What are some other ways, Hank, to listen to the podcast? You know, the second best way, if you have not downloaded the mobile app, is get subscribed to the Beyond Clean newsletter. Every week we send out the new episodes, including our vendor spotlight episodes. We can learn about new technologies and companies out there changing the way that we do sterile processing. You can check it out anywhere that podcasts are found. And if you're not already subscribed to us on Facebook and LinkedIn, check it out there because we got a ton of other content besides the podcast coming through every single week from expert series and events. Do not miss it. And the most important thing, Justin, is if you love the show, go give us a five-star rating and review on those podcast apps and on the podcast feeds to share your love and to and to help us share the love with brand new technicians coming into the industry today. As we wrap this up, though, if you've got an idea for a great guest or a topic or interview, let us know at info at beyondclean.net because we want to bring those voices out to the masses, not just here in the United States, but across the globe. And as we like to say around here at Beyond Clean, until we talk to you again next time, keep fighting dirty. Keep fighting dirty.